Hello, uh, can you hear me well? I hope so. So uh, thanks for all of you who came here today. Uh, I'm honored. Uh, my name is Petra and I am working as a cartographer uh, at MapTiler and today we'll be talking about vector tiles cartography and how to elevate your maps with JSON tricks. Uh, first of all, uh, can you raise your hand if you already worked with vector tiles? Wow. So that's a full room of pros and with style JSONs. Okay, so I hope you will learn something new. <laughs> okay, so uh, I can probably skip this slide because you already uh, both uh, know uh, all this stuff. Uh, I will probably just mention that uh, uh, in the first stages of vector tiles, uh, they used to be generated in the pseudo Mercator projection introduced by Google Maps, but nowadays uh, everyone is more lean, lean, uh, leaning to the uh, globe and adaptive projections based on the zoom. And uh, the uh, important thing here is that the vector tiles uh, keep data only and styling is uh, rendered dynamically on the client. And this is why we need a style JSON. This is the document that defines the visual appearance of your map. And it's a typical JSON file with like a key value structure with some uh, specific uh, properties which uh, you can recognize easily. For example, here, I will start with uh, root properties. So you can have like version, name, metadata, uh, that's kind of boring, but you can have it, it's useful. Uh, then uh, center, zoom, pitch, and bearing, uh, this group that's defined in the initial rendering position of the map, for example, focused on Tartu. Uh, then uh, sources and layers group, uh, these are pretty important properties because uh, with sources you are calling your data into the map, and with layers you are defining the styling itself, the order, and what's where in the map. Then you can have also glyphs property, uh, rendering the fonts, and sprites for loading the images. Uh, I have highlighted, uh, I have highlighted version sources and layers because these are mandatory, and you cannot have a functioning style JSON without them. Okay, uh, and uh, for the uh, style JSON, I will be relying on the MapLibre style spec. Uh, I think you already know what MapLibre is, but uh, just to be sure, it's a GLJS library for rendering uh, vector tiles maps in a web browser. And I would recommend you to check this MapLibre style spec uh, anytime you want, even during the presentation, uh, especially this uh, table of contents. So uh, now let's get to the layers in the style JSON and how to use them in a map. First, uh, I will start with the layer properties. So in the layers group, every layer needs to have ID uh, and type defined. So type can be like a fill, line, symbol, background, circle, heat map, and so on. Uh, source, you need to specify that as well uh, for every la layer except for the background. So here, for example, the source is uh, called map tile planet, but you can have it called uh, something else. It's calling the vector tiles or any other source. Then uh, especially for the vector tiles, you need to specify the source layer. So uh, because they have like more layers in the data source, it's not just one. Uh, here, for example, it's water, but uh, there is also like transportation, POI, uh, water, nature, and uh, so on. And then you have paint properties for defining the style, the color, the opacity, and the layout properties for defining like the positioning uh, and so on. And with this uh, sample code, you can have something similar to what you can see on the background. Uh, now let's get to the fill properties. So these are mainly for the polygon data. Most uh, of the used ones uh, in the spec are the opacity, color, translate, and pattern. So with the opacity, you can achieve some nice visibility transitions uh, across zoom. So uh, you can start with like zero opacity and uh, then gradually uh, increase that uh, to a value one that uh, equals like full visibility. Uh, such example can be seen here, but uh, it's like ending on the 0 0.35. Uh, and yeah, you can also have like a disappearing layer. A fill, color, fill color that's pretty self-explaining. Uh, I also mentioned a fill outline color, but this one is a bit tricky because uh, the WebGL has some limitations and uh, it doesn't allow the fill outline property to uh, be changed by the width. So we can change color, but it's like just one pixel outline. So uh, what I recommend is to use line outline, so like a line layer on top of the fill layer. 
and you can uh, change the width uh, and color as well there. Uh, then the fill translate, uh, you can uh, move the geometry with that, so in like horizontal or vertical direction, and uh, you can achieve some nice drop shadow effect like you can see here on the coastline. So that's an uh, example of this one. For example, here you have like value two. And you can have also a fill pattern, so with that you can achieve like a decorative uh, design, repeating. Uh, as you might notice, uh, I used some uh, zoom expressions in the uh, in the previous slide. So, uh, as you can see here, for example, uh, these are like formulas for computing the property value uh, in the style JSON uh, from the data. So, uh, like a basic expression can be seen here. So you have like a, uh, it's like a JSON array. So you have like operator equals and two arguments class and country. So we are filtering just country classes. You can also uh, combine expressions together. So here we have like has ISO A2. So uh, the filter is taking both uh, these uh, filters into account. Then you have like uh, you can have uh, nested expressions. So uh, like uh, here we have interpolating expressions uh, across Zoom, and you have like a case expression and better than, or uh, bigger than, sorry. So uh, you can nest uh, expressions together as well. And one popular exp expression is also the match. Uh, so here we are like matching uh, color based on the classes of land cover. Uh, now for the line pl properties, so some of the most used ones are opacity, color, width, uh, blur, dash array, and cap and join. So uh, the most important one is probably the width, because with that you can achieve like hierarchy of your data uh, across the zooms. So uh, here, for example, you can see like interpolated uh, again across the zoom. So as the zoom is getting bigger, the width is getting bigger. And as well uh, as uh, we have some kind of hierarchy here. So like uh, motorway is, uh, you know, uh, like bigger in the width than some minor roads. Uh, with line blur, you can achieve some uncertainty effect on your data uh, with line dash array. This is uh, pretty useful for styling borders, railways, ferries, construction roads, etc. You can define like a gap between the dashes or have it like dotted and so on. And with line cap engine, you can define how the line ends, if it's round or square. A uh, nice trick for the, uh, for the line width is uh, this uh, hatching. Uh, you need two layers for that, so like a typical line layer with some color and width, and then uh, you will have another layer on top of that uh, with like extreme line width. For example, here we have value eight on the zoom level 20, and then a line dash array in a format of a very small number and very big number. So uh, then you can achieve uh, this railway hatching uh, style. Then another trick with line offset, uh, we use that typically for trails because uh, the line data, they have uh, the same geometry, they are in the same position, but they have different attributes uh, based on the colors. So if you want to you know, uh, render them uh, separately and uh, avoid overlapping, you need to set a line offset. So for example, for the first color for the red, you will, see, uh, you will use like line offset of zero, but then for the others, you will use, for example, value two or minus two on the other side of the line, or, uh, and then like virtually uh, you can increase that. Uh, now for the symbol properties. So the, these are used for uh, texts and icons in your map. Uh, I will start with uh, the layout properties, symbol spacing, placement, and third key. So symbol placement can be either point or line. So a point, that's for example, this bus station. And uh, line property, uh, uh, line placement is uh, for example here on the river. It's commonly used for water features. Uh, symbol spacing, that's uh, uh, being used just on the line placement. So with that, uh, for example, here we achieved that there is only one label uh, in this view uh, because uh, it's basically defining the gap between the labels uh, rendered across the line. So if I wouldn't use any spacing here, we would see, for example, like four labels here across the river. And then the symbol sort key, that's pretty uh, useful for uh, POIs especially. 
uh, if you have uh, some kind of uh, importance attribute in your data, you can use that. And uh, if uh, the POIs are like colliding on some zooms, the renderer it will always prefer the more important one. Another set of uh, properties for symbols is this one, size, opacity, color, halo, offset or anchor, and uh, parameter optional. Uh, here you need to specify like a prefix uh, for either icon or text. It's not uh, just like symbol opacity, it needs to be specified if it's for icon or text. Uh, you can of course define the size uh, based on the zooming. Uh, then with opacity, apart from like visibility transitions, you can achieve again some kind of hierarchy. So for example, on the zoom level 15, you can uh, call with this match expression just uh, some of the important classes for you. And then uh, on the next zoom, you can uh, just uh, set the opacity to one and you will see all of the data. Uh, then uh, we have also the halo property, so that's uh, pretty useful for better readability against the map background, sorry. And uh, you can define color, width, and blur for that. Uh, blur is kind of like for blending into the map a bit, and color is mostly uh, like white or black based on uh, the theme of your map. But uh, it can be anything else. Uh, then offset or anchor, these are used uh, for like adjusting the position of the label of, uh, or, or uh, for the icon. And uh, like what I do, for example, first I use the anchor because that can be like bottom, middle or top. But if that doesn't work or you need to adjust that like uh, really precisely for just a few pixels, you can use the offset. And the parameter optional, that is again something uh, for cases when uh, the labels or icons collide. So you can uh, specify, for example, text optional, and that means uh, if it's like uh, overlapping with some uh, other feature, you will see uh, just the icon without the corresponding text. Uh, for loading of the images uh, to the symbols, you need to have a sprite URL that can look like this. Uh, it's referenced in the icon image and fill pattern property. Uh, about the fill pattern, I was talking uh, about that for the fill layers. So for the polygons example, you can see here, uh, it's a like pattern for the forest and icon image this, uh, like uh, for example, this museum. Icon image or fill pattern, they can be defined like really uh, easily. Like you can just specify icon image forest or uh, typically for POIs, you can use this coalesce uh, expression, which is like checking uh, if the class is matching uh, some, some image in your sprite. Then if not, it will check for a subclass, and if not, uh, it will assign like a default icon a dot. A sprite consists of like a JSON and PNG file. It's typically generated from SVGs. Uh, you can use, for example, this command line tool Spread for the generation of the sprite. Uh, icons should be around like 20 uh, to 20 pixels uh, in size, and patterns should be seamless to be properly rendered. Uh, sprites can be either SDF, this means that the sprite is behaving like a vector, and you can uh, change the styling dynamically, you can change size, color, outline, and so on. But uh, you need to uh, generate that out of a single colored images, uh, typically just black. And uh, it's not uh, useful much for the patterns and for multicolored icons. So uh, if you need that, you should uh, generate a raster sprite. And there you need to define the styling before the rendering, so assign the color before that. And if you don't want to bother with uh, creating some icons yourself, I would recommend this Maki icon set. Uh, this is example of the sprite PNG file. So it's like a big uh, image combining all of the patterns and uh, icons together. And here on the left side, that's a sample of a JSON uh, of the sprite. So that's defining uh, the names and the position and the size of the icons or patterns. You can even have a map just uh, generated out of patterns. As for the fonts, uh, so we are uh, calling that from the glyphs property. Again, you need to have a URL for that with uh, these two tokens, font stack and range. And uh, font stack is defining basically what font list you have in your map. Range is specific for every font. For example, if it uh, supports like extended Latin, it has different range uh, compared to, uh, to some different font. 
Uh, it's referenced in the text field uh, that can be, again, like pretty simple, like text field name, or you can uh, combine different attributes there, like uh, with the concatenate expression, so you can have like name and elevation, or name and year, and so on. Uh, for the global maps, it's pretty important to have a fallback font. So that's the second one here in the text font property. That's uh, making sure if your uh, first font isn't covering all of the uh, possible glyphs on your map, for example, Chinese letters, uh, it will fall back to the next one. And the Notosans is the best uh, like language coverage uh, font out there. It's on Google Fonts. Uh, again, for the generating of the fonts, you can use this fontnic command line tool, or there is uh, like a set of ready to use fonts on the open map tiles. Uh, I will quickly just uh, mention uh, some other layer properties uh, and other layer types. So you can have circle, uh, heat map, fill extrusion, raster, or hill shade in your map. For example, this fill extrusion, this is like adding a 2.5D uh, effect. Uh, it's typically used for buildings in, in maps. Or uh, yeah, you can have a map just as a raster. This is like a satellite layer, and you can uh, put some vector uh, data on top of that, such as borders or labels. And uh, yeah, about the sources, you always need to specify the URL and type of the source. Uh, the types can be a vector, raster, raster DEM, GeoJSON, or even video and image and it needs to be specified based on the tile JSON spec. And yeah, uh, some of these, they have some specific properties, such as uh, for vector tiles, they need to have a scheme. Here uh, we have uh, basically defined all of the source layers. Uh, and uh, what I would uh, definitely recommend uh, in the end uh, to make your life easier when working with tile JSON, you should uh, use some editors. They will catch your mistakes before you can. Uh, the uh, the most used, I think, is this open source Maputnik tool, because there, when you write the JSON for the individual layers, you can also see the map rendering there. Uh, or I would also recommend JSON view extension for Chrome, because uh, it will format uh, any, any JSON out there uh, in the web browser. So you can check some other style JSONs from the internet. Uh, in MapTiler, uh, we, uh, like historically, we used to use the Maputnik, but uh, in the previous year we developed a new tool called MapTiler Customize, so uh, feel free to try it if you want. It's available for free after login. And uh, the um, mo oh, okay. So there should be a video, but never mind. <laughs> you, <laughs> you, can, you can try that yourself. Uh, so uh, the biggest advantage of the customize is that you don't need to know uh, about this style JSON structure because there is UI and you can do uh, almost anything uh, based on the spec on the click. And you can also see underlying data sources and what you are filtering. So uh, yeah, uh, I will <laughs> hopefully skip this. Yeah, and uh, that is uh, all from me. Uh, thank you for your attention and uh, happy to answer some questions. And now is where somebody from the audience raises their hand and we ask questions right here. The man in the Map Liberty shirt. Hi. Uh, so you shared the so you shared some tricks for uh, getting the railway lines and uh, getting nice uh, paths. Um, but uh, as a as a pro, you must have other uh, pro tips for styling maps. Can you share sh share some more, maybe? Well, uh, like it's it's hard to just you know throw it out out of my head, uh, but uh, yeah, some of I think like the most uh, uh, designs that I do are like uh, like combining various expressions. So it's like you know uh, you specify uh, with a case uh, just uh, use for example this elevation for the uh, these mountains and then uh, you define like uh, this will be bigger than others uh, like typically it always has something to do with zoom and something with size and possible possibly with different colors so always there is like this interpolate expression across various zooms then you are like uh, getting all of the uh, sizes or width with bigger and then uh, with with the filters you are defining that for example 
uh, this uh, mountain, if it's like uh, uh, bigger than 2,000 meters, it should be this size, it should be this color, uh, and so on. This is typically used also for all of the road network, for all of the labels, uh, you know, like, uh, if you have a vector tiles map, you always need to take into account every zoom level that the user can be zooming into. So, uh, yeah, uh, that's probably what I would recommend, like dig into the expressions and always focus on, uh, on the zoom levels and adjust all of the styling based on the zoom. For example, like if you are zoomed uh, into the, uh, the whole world, you uh, need to also adjust the font for that or the size of the font for that. But uh, then, for example, you have, and you have the, the background, like the polygon, uh, polygon uh, land cover, for example. But then as you zoom in, you don't need that much of the land cover and you don't need that uh, big size of the continents, for example. You need to, again, uh, adjust that based on zoom so you can fade out the land cover uh, and then use, uh, use a different font size for the labels, call more data into the zoom and stuff like that, yeah. So, so it's a lot of uh, trial and error. Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure, for and, sure. And <laughs> I have, I have one more question. Uh, do you also use a, a, a style builder internally, or do you generate the styles and then? Uh, we um, we don't use a style builder. Like currently, we use the customize only. So uh, yeah, like we sure uh, dig into the code, like in VS Code or something like that. But uh, primarily, uh, that's also one one kind of trick I would recommend. Don't start out of scratch. You can, you know, pull any style JSON uh, open source or like from, from our cloud and then you modify it. So, you know, you don't need to write the whole root properties, everything just just in uh, in some editor, but you can start for, from something existing and modify that. So, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for starting at the back here. Uh, okay. Thanks, uh, great presentation. I was wondering about uh, best practice uh, in terms of different screen sizes that you're targeting. Do you design mobile first or you have separate styling for, you know, depending on the target clients? Uh, so uh, it's again, like I said, it's a bit trial and error. L like every time we are developing a map, you need to, of course, check that uh, if that works on big screens or if that works on mobile. Like fortunately, we are not doing, you know, posters maps. So that's completely another thing and you need to have, for example, display fonts for that and stuff like that. But we need to ensure that uh, the maps are like working all right on the PC screens as well as on the mobile. So uh, it's basically, uh, you, you are developing the map and you are always checking that on uh, different kinds of screens. It's not like universal, it's different for every map based on the fonts, based on the amount of data you have there. So uh, always you are, you are just trying that out. For example, if I uh, work on an outdoor map, I check that, of course, on the on the notebook, but then I go outside on some like actual trail, and I'm checking if that actually works for me, like if I can see all the features I need there and yeah, stuff like that. Hi, uh, thanks for the interesting presentation. Uh, just one question: If I have a um, in QGIS a very sophisticated style, is there a way how to transfer it into? Um, this map style. Oh, I like from QHS, QJS, my style, if it's very sophisticated, can I also um, display it with map tiler? Mm, uh, it's the other way around, like possible only, because like from, from QGIS, uh, you cannot pull that possibly into the into our cloud. Mm, that's, that's quite a shame. We should probably <laughs> look into that direction. Uh, in the other way, it's possible. Like if you pull a uh, style JSON into the QGIS, that's all right. Sometimes uh, some complicated expression uh, doesn't work, but you can compensate for that, or you can just you know pull it uh, as a VMTS, WMTS, yeah. Yeah, um, I will. I need to point out that there's this thing called QGIS to web, a QGIS plugin that will try to 
try to automatically transfer the QJS styles into vectoral style sheets, but it's, it's for complicated use cases, it might not be it. And I think that's all the time we have for questions. So thank you again, Petra.